I'm Roland Thomas. I'm a data architect from the Data and Analytics Services Group. That's Privat's group. And I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to give two talks. Um, the first talk is going to be about Python and Jupyter at NERSC. Um, so the idea here is to kind of give everybody a set of kind of high level takeaways about do's and don'ts with Python and Jupyter at NERSC. But um, first of all, before I get started, I want to know how many people in here are Python users. So who uses it for like just scripting, just like manage your jobs, your workflow, take the output of one program and put it into another? Is that kind of what people do? A little bit of that. How many NumPy users do we have? SciPy users, Pandas users, okay. How about the Keras people, people who use Python as a platform machine for machine learning? I guess nobody's doing that, really? Hmm. All right. Okay, well, thanks for, for letting me know. So um, presumably you all want to do science and you want to do science with Python at NERSC. So this slide is just an example of some of the things that people do in terms of science through Python at NERSC. So there's the materials project. In fact, I saw a few materials project stickers on people's laptops, so you probably know what that's all about. Workflows mon uh, being managed with fireworks here at NERSC. Um, People also do data analysis or data flow or managing workflows like the LHC data processing workflow. Um, there's also processing for sky surveys, cosmology, cosmic frontier stuff is a, is a big deal here at NERSC. So that's over here on this side. Um, of course, it's a platform for machine learning and deep learning really is the way to go. And then there are actually some simulation codes like uh, warp or InBody kit, which are actually written mostly in Python uh, or Python with C extensions or Fortran linked into them. Those are simulation codes and some of those run here at NERSC as well. Um, the most important thing to know about Python, getting started with Python at NERSC is that we have really awesome documentation. It's awesome because I wrote it. And <laughs> we have a lot of uh, really good stuff in there. We try to up, keep it up to date pretty continuously. It has a frequently asked questions page. If you have a new question that you think you find yourself frequently asking yourself, then suggest it to us. Um, there's also a page uh, for tips on how to use KNLs from Python. And we also have a new page on optimizing, optimizing Python. Um, uh, first of all, this morning, I think you, you learned about the software module system at NERSC. If, if Rebecca was, was giving a good talk, then uh, she talked about modules, or somebody did. Um, the way to get Python working at NERSC is through modules you must always be sure to load a Python module. Do not ever, ever, ever use user bin Python. That's the system Python that came with the, the Cray, so it's a little bit old. Um, but you can do the, the kind of standard user bin env Python thing once you have a module loaded so that you can get the, the Python interpreter running in your script. If you don't know what versions of Python modules we have currently on Cori, you can do module avail. Python. Now, this is not the only way you can use Python at NERSC. You can install your own Python if you want. You can compile it from source if that's your thing. Um, but there's other more recommended ways of doing that. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, NERSC's Python is Anaconda Python. How many people have used Anaconda Python, say, on their laptop? Yeah, most people, right? Um, it's kind of the, the distribution of Python of choice, especially because it's really good at providing tools for data analytics and scientific computing and getting you going it has this handy package tool called Conda. It lets you build these environments that are customized. You have your own set of libraries that you like to work with. You can completely destroy that whole environment and build it all over again if you like in a matter of minutes. So it's very popular. Um, Conda environments replace virtual env. Who have, who's ever used virtual env? It's kind of the older tool. Um, they kind of replace virtual env and do a lot more than virtual env. There's a few other package tools out there like pipenv. Has anybody heard of pipenv? Yeah, you can use pipenv too if you want. Um, of course, uh, Anaconda Python has many hundreds of, of very useful packages. Um, the reason that we made Anaconda Python our default Python is because they added um, the Intel math kernel library a few years ago into it and then there was no really no real reason for us to build our own Python distribution because the main thing we did for users was link in MKL. So it comes for free now. 
Um, there's all kinds of channels out there for, you know, if you are part of a community that does, I don't know, cosmic microwave background stuff and you have your own way of compiling and own set of, of, of packages that you like to put together, um, you can use channels to get those too. Um, the modules, the anaconda modules are monolithic. There's like a whole anaconda that comes inside of that module. There are a few add-on modules like H5Pi Parallel. So if you need to use Parallel H5Pi, then you need to add that module. Um, these are the uh, modules that you should be using on Query right now. Um, 2.7, Anaconda 4.4, Python 3.6, Anaconda 4.4. Those, those two, so if you're a 2.7 person or a 3.6 person, those are the ones that are there. There's a few other modules. You can mix in, you can try, try different ones out. Um, I've decided that what we'll do is we'll keep 2.7 as the default module. So if you do just module load Python, it will load a default module. That will be Python 2.7 until um, the end of this year when 2.7 is done. So if you're, how many people have switched to Python 3? All right, those of you, you're on borrowed time. You have six months, okay? Um, and in fact, there's this, there's this handy website here that will tell you exactly when Python 2.7 will retire. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> countdown. Um, I think there's supposed to be a party at PyCon 2020 also, if you want to go to that. Um, so, if, you know, if you, if you forget exactly when it is, uh, you, can, you can, can look there. Of course, I, I did that, and then I, I messed up the, the thing. Real smart, Rowan. All right. Um, is this it? Ha. All right. I'm even smarter. Okay. All right. So. Switch to Python 3 in about six months. Okay, Conda environments, it seems like everybody knows how to do Conda environments, right? So Conda create dash n, and then this, this uh, Python equals whatever is pretty important because it might pick for you and you want to make sure that it's the Python that you want, probably Python 3. Uh, and then you activate, activate the environment and you can go on and install whatever you want. You can use pip. Um, actually, I tend to prefer to use pip instead of go find Conda Forge stuff, uh, but that's just me. Uh, if you do use pip, I think a couple of handy flags are no cache deer. That means don't start the build in, in a cache, like in a cached place. And then if you have to restart the build, pick up from that, make it start all the way over by downloading the package. You know, there's a lot of, I mentioned that because a lot of users kind of get stuck and they don't know what's wrong. And then I go in and I try to just build it from the beginning and it looks like I didn't do anything and it all just works. Um, also, I've decided don't try to do this um, pip install dash dash user thing quite so much, um, just go ahead and stick it straight in your conda environment. Don't, don't put it over in Python user base unless you really have a good reason for doing that. If you don't really know what I'm talking about, then that's fine. Just stick to conda. All right. Um, doing things yourself, if you don't like our modules for whatever reason, because or you don't even, you don't like to do the module load thing, uh, you can install your own anaconda installation if you like. Um, just a couple of tips there. Make sure you don't have a Python module loaded and unset this Python startup thing. Um, but this is how you do it. You just grab this installer from Anaconda. It seems like probably everybody knows how to do that, but you can do this just fine on Cori too. Um, and then you just set it up so you can do source activate. All right, a um, couple, couple little things that are special about Cori that you need to know. You should not ever conda install MPI for Pi. So if you want to use MPI from Python, you use MPI for Pi. Don't ever do conda install MPI for Pi. Uh, it won't work right. It might look like it works on one node or something like that, but then you go to two nodes and it'll make no sense. Um, what you need to do is you need to compile the MPI for Pi against the Cray impitch. And it's very easy to do. So here I just have like five lines. The first one is just download the package, unpack it, CD in there, swap a module. So you're using the GNU compiler. I think you can use the Intel compiler too. It probably, probably doesn't matter, but I, I usually do this. The only thing you have to do is python setup.py build and then tell it where MPICC, the MPICC compiler is. And that's just the compiler wrapper that we talked about this morning, right? CC. If you do that, then you'll have built your own MPI for Pi. And you only need to do this if you create a conda environment and you want to use MPI for Pi from that. If you're using mine, module load Python, MPI for Pi is there. Um, I have a couple of slides about parallelism with Python. Um, just generally, people tend to use process level parallelism in Python a lot just because it's easier to, to push. 
Okay, so um, what I mean by that is thread level parallelism you can really only get by using a compiled library, like in C or whatever. You can, there's a few other things you can do, but mostly people use MKL from NumPy, and it's threaded and vectorized and all of that, and so that, that works pretty good. But usually when people are writing Python, they kind of use MPI for Pi or multiprocessing or Dask or PySpark to kind of get parallelism going. So you'll see these jobs that are like flat MPI jobs. By that I mean like 68 MPI ranks on a, on a KNL node, and that's kind of how, how people are all. Um, but you can do both. You can do hybrid parallelism. It's just the same as submitting any other kind of job that's hybrid parallel. Um, I think I went over that one already. Um, one bit of information is that the only one of these parallel libraries that really could like scale to the whole machine is going to be MPI for Pi. Okay, but if you're going to try to scale to a significant portion of the machine, it's a Python application or a, or a hybrid Python C, C++ kind of application, you're going to want to do something besides just launch it out of your home directory. And that's because of some characteristics of our file system, namely Python's import mechanism is really uh, metadata intensive. Basically, anytime you do import NumPy, it goes through the whole file system, through your whole Python path and all of that stuff, trying to open libraries everywhere. And so if you have um, 100,000 MPI ranks, or even 100 MPI ranks, they're all going to do that kind of more or less at the same time. So in, they're all doing uh, import NumPy. What happens is those requests go to a single metadata server. And they say, hey, you guys get in line. I'll get to all of your requests in order. Okay, So your application is going to spend a half hour doing import NumPy. right? So you don't want to do that. That's bad. So these are these, this is actually. Um, a uh, thing where I do import NumPy and then this package called AstroPy, which has lots and lots of little, little sub-modules in it, and how long it takes to, to import that at that 4800 rank scale there on different file systems. Um, so the one with the best performance on the right is with Shifter, which is a container technology, which just so happens to be the next, uh, the next talk. Um, but the second best performance you can get besides building a Shifter container and running from there is to use the uh, global common file system that Jalin mentioned earlier. Um, so generally, don't like do a, a big MPI NumPy import from your home directory. It's so bad, I don't even benchmark it. Okay, Scratch is okay. Project is not that great, but Global Common is kind of your second best one. All right, how to profile and debug Python applications? Uh, there's of course good old printf. If that's the thing that you do, a lot of the time that's how people get started doing it. Is you just have to remember to unbuffer the output from both srun and Python. Um, but we have, as I mentioned, a whole page about how to uh, profile applications, going kind of from easier to use to to kind of more um, difficult or kind of professional grade tools. Python comes with C profile, and that works just fine on Cori. Um, you can use a tool like Snake, SnakeViz or gprof 2 dot, which is uh, what this visualization is here to see where your code is spending its time, and then you can work on the bottlenecks there. Um, there's a, even a way to do this with MPI processes. Just follow that link. Um, line Profiler is a tool you can use uh, to study the, where your bottle, where, why your bottleneck is a bottleneck. We've also developed a package here called Time Memory, which, um, does, which you can instrument into your code. So you put little decorators on functions, and it tells you how much time it spends in that function, how much memory is being used, all kinds of neat stuff. It works with MPI. It works with if you've got a Python and C++ application. And of course, there's uh, Vtune uh, for Intel Python and um, Tau, which both work on Python. OK, so are there any questions about Python? Like I could handle one maybe right now. It's all pretty clear. What's nice, I think, is that we've set it up so that it's kind of not a big deal, right? OK. Um, how many people use Jupyter at all? OK. How about at, at, at NERSC? OK, cool. All right. Um, so Jupyter is uh, you know, this really powerful platform for data analytics, uh, for um, creating documents that have code, text, equations, visualizations, widgets, all kinds of nifty stuff in it. Um, our default Jupyter deployment is Jupyter Lab, and it has been since, basically since they said they weren't in beta anymore. Today is the release of Jupyter Lab 1.0, I think. So we'll probably be upgrading this in the next few weeks. Uh, to use Jupyter at NERSC, we've, we've set up a hub. 
which is a, a place where you log in and then you can launch from, and that's the URL you can go to, jupiter.nurse.gov. So if you were a long-time Jupyter, or a recent Jupyter user, you might have used Jupyter Dev or Jupyter. They're the same thing now, so we've smooshed them together into one thing. And um, what you can do there is you can um, pick where you want your notebook to start up. You can have it start up on Cori, or you can have it start up in this container uh, environment called Spin. Um, but mostly people are going to want to start up their notebooks on Cori. We have not one node now, not two, but we have three nodes set aside that are kind of like login nodes for all of the notebooks that people run. And at any given time, there's about 150 or 200 notebooks running uh, across those three nodes. Um, why would you want to run on, on Cori? Well, you, of course, your notebooks would then be on Cori. They could see the Cori Scratch file system. It's the same kind of Python environment as if you SSH'd in. Um, you can also submit jobs there. We have uh, uh, some handy little tools for submitting jobs from, from cells uh, called uh, Slurm Magics. The spin shared uh, node configuration is external to Cori, so it's not, not in Cori. It can't see Scratch. You can't submit jobs from it. What that's for is you have a paper deadline, and you need to get to your data that's on project so you can make that last plot for your paper. Okay, so that's backup. I'll say that um, I think last time I looked, there were 200 notebooks running on Cori and then like two in spin. Okay, so it's kind of the, it's the backup. So if Cori is down for maintenance, you can maybe use spin. All right, the most common Jupyter question I get is how do I take a Conda environment that I created and use that from inside a Jupyter notebook there's a few different ways to do this, but here's the way that I recommend. So you log into to, to Cori, you SSH in, you create your Conda environment, but you have to add one package called ipykernel. Okay, if you do that, then the next thing you can do is this python-m ipykernel install here. This is all documented, so if you can't remember this, you can find it on the website, and then you can do that. What this does is this creates this JSON file called a kernel spec file, and it drops it in a special place. It tells you where it is, so if you want to go look at it, you can. Okay, once you've done that, um, yeah, once you've done that, you point your browser at jupyter.nurse.gov. You may need to restart your notebook server, but once you do that, you should see that kernel show up, and then you should be able to click it, and then you have that conda environment from your, from your notebook. This is what the kernel spec file looks like, so it's just JSON, but basically all it does is it takes an argument, which is run Python, and then launch my kernel, and then some connection file stuff, which don't worry about it, that's Jupyter stuff, okay? Now, why am I showing you this? Because you can actually do more than just this with this. Um, you can customize the environment, so you can add this little, in red, in red, this environment stanza, basically, there that lets you set the path, or the LD library path, or all that stuff that people like to, to customize with. I don't actually like this quite so much. The way that I like to do this, to, to do this kind of customization, like if you want to add a module or something like that, is don't run Python, run a script that wrappers Python, okay? So the way that you do that is you, you change that kernel spec file so that instead of the first argument being to do Python, it's do this shell script at some place, okay? And then inside that shell script, this kind of helper guy, you say export whatever you want. Hey, this is like a real, real common one is people want to make matplotlib plots with LaTeX, um, you know, labels or whatever, this is a way that you can do it. You could do module load this, and then what it actually does is it just runs the IPy kernel piece, the kernel piece. Okay, so if you have other modules that you want to be able to talk to from Jupyter, you can load them this way. And then Shifter is the container technology I'm going to talk about next. This is how you could run a kernel from inside a Shifter container. That's also documented on the website, I think. If not, it's on the slides here. We should add it. And then before you write me a ticket and say something's wrong with Jupyter, what you should do is you should look at your notebook server's log file. And the place where that's found is in your home directory at .jupyter.log. It used to just be called jupyter.log, but people told us they didn't like seeing it. So if we put dot in front of it, now they don't see it, but we, all, but we the staff, know where it all is. But what it's got is it's got all the stuff that your server says it's doing. And if you see an error in there, that might give you a, a hint. Okay, um, we're working on ways to expand support for Jupyter. You can run 
Uh, you can run things like Dask or Spark on compute nodes and talk to them from notebooks. And so we'll, I can tell you all about that if you want to know. Um, we are going to have a way for people to launch notebooks on compute nodes so that you don't have to share with you know, 66 other people, but you have to pay. Okay. Um, and then we're also working on interfaces inside Jupyter Lab that kind of expose Slurm and things like that. So maybe you don't need to ever SSH in ever again. Um, so this is kind of the key takeaways. It's basically use Conda, uh, stuff about MPI for Pi. You should use Shifter if you want to scale at all in Python. Then down here, the number one question I get from Jupyter, Jupyter users is, how do I use a Conda environment for my notebook? So we went over that. Okay. All right. So do you have any questions about Python? Yeah. Or Jupyter? Yeah. Yeah. So I had a question about Dask, actually. Mm -hmm. so Okay, so all right. So the the questions about Dask. Who knows what Dask is? Yeah. So Dask is one of these kind of newer frameworks for starting up little clusters that you submit work to in the form of a direct directed acyclic graph. You have tasks; they depend on each other, and you say, "Just go do them." Um, the architecture for Dask distributed is that there's a scheduler, and that's the person you submit work to. And then there's workers, and those are the people who get the stuff from the scheduler and do it. OK, so how do you run Dask distributed at NERSC? Um, there's a few different ways. One would be to set up a job where you start the scheduler, Dask scheduler, dash dash, the thing that drops the scheduler file, ampersand. Then the next thing is da S run all the Dask workers. OK, so those are the things that get the S run. The scheduler runs on the head node, but the workers run across the, all of the all of the nodes that are in the job, and then you start your client script up after that. Okay? If it's Jupyter, you have to figure out a way to, to wire up the connection between the notebook and the scheduler. I can tell you more about how to do that in a minute. But generally, this would be a way for you to, to start up a DAS cluster inside of a job and uh, submit work to it from a client script. So that's, that's kind of the way to go. Now we, we want, when you do that, though, what we want you to do is to make sure that you turn on um, the SSL. So there's a few options. You may need to create some certificate files. You can use a package called CertiPy to do that. Um, that that kind of just encrypts the communication between all the pieces. Okay? So but if we have more, if you have time afterwards, I, I might have a couple minutes before I head out to, to talk about that. But, or send me an email. My email address is there. We're looking for Dask users. Yeah. Okay.